So welcome everyone to Hal Shreve and Kyle Lukoff in conversation about Kyle's new book, Too Bright to See. Uh, my name is Greg Newton. I am the co-founder with my partner, Donnie Jokum of the Bureau of General Services Queer Division, a queer bookstore and event space that is hosted by the LGBT Community Center in Manhattan. Uh, both the center and the Bureau have been closed since last year, since March, but uh, we're hoping that we will open again in 2021 at some point. Uh, and I will make a lot of noise online when we can do that because we can't wait. Um, we love doing these virtual events with you, but we really want to be in the same space with you when we can make that happen. Uh, a couple things before we get started. One, I wanted to share with you our online store. So you can see what that page looks like, bgsqd.com slash store. And we've been doing a little promo thing where we, books for events, for upcoming events, we put on sale for 25% off. So Too Bright to See is still on sale till 12 p.m. tonight, 25% um, off. So you can get that on the store anytime today and you will still get that 25% off. And the book is now out and shipping, so I highly recommend it. I also wanted to point out that at the top of the page, you see there's a Reclaim Pride Coalition recommends. Uh, we've partnered, we, the Bureau, have partnered with the Reclaim Pride Coalition. If you don't know them, they're a group that formed uh, in 2019 for the Stonewall 50 march or in response to it and it was they they launched the queer liberation march as an alternative to the heritage of pride march for a variety of reasons which you can read on the the website um, in any case they did the march last year and they're going to be doing it again this year and i strongly encourage everyone to go but the bureau is also partnering with reclaim pride coalition to bring you uh, some panel events um, that we've done two of, and we have three more coming up in the weeks leading up to Pride. So please check out our website to see upcoming events that we'll be posting there. We actually have a lot going on in May and June before it gets quiet in July. So I'm gonna get started. I'm super happy to have Kyle back and to have Hal back. Hal launched um, his book at the Bureau. Was that 2019? It was a while was ago. Yeah, yeah. So we're happy to have you here virtually. And we look forward to the day when we can have you back in the flesh. I'm going to briefly read their bios, and then we're going to get started. Uh, I also want to point out, if you have questions, you can post them in the chat function. And we'll get to those at the end. Uh, or you can raise your hand and ask the question yourself, because we're a small group. So, Kaya Lukoff is the Stonewall Award-winning author, When Aiden Became a Brother, as well as other picture books like Call Me Max, Explosion at the Poem Factory, and The Forthcoming, If You're a Kid Like Gavin. Hal Shreve is the author of Out of Salem, long-listed for the National Book Award, and is a librarian at the NYPL. So please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to Kyle and Hal. Thanks, Greg. Hi, and everyone. Shadow. Oh, Shadow left. Oh, Shadow left. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> All right. Um, so, hi, Kyle. Um, hi, Hal. Um, so, uh, Kyle sent me his book, Too Right to See, a little while ago, and I read it in basically one sitting in like two and a half hours. Um, and I cried, and then I went downstairs and told all of my roommates everything about the book. Um, it is a really beautiful book. Um, and sometimes like a, a quiet middle grade novel can be a hard sell, but it's just like, it captures all of these feelings about being a kid in general. Um, and then like trans being trans specifically in a small town, um, having kind of like magical but unsettling things happen to you in, in ways that you can't articulate or describe to other people. Um, and it, it really resonated with me. And one of the favorite things about this book for me was the way Kyle um, writes about ghosts 
and I love ghosts. Um, I have like, I have a soft spot for like kind ghosts. And this is a book about like a, a loving kind ghost. Um, and Kyle, so my first, my first question for you uh, today is um, Bug, the main character, is used to encountering ghosts um, in the house where Bug lives. There's a lot of presences that Bug feels, even if other people can't feel them, but very few of them ever try to actually directly interact with Bug, um, and Bug just kind of perceives their presence. But after Bug's Uncle Roderick dies, um, unsettling and kind of dangerous things start to happen um, around Bug, like the electricity goes crazy and there's um, a nail polish bottle that is in an inconvenient position on the floor and is stepped on. Um, and later in the story, Bug is trying to figure out like what's going on and is researching and reads about poltergeists um, and uh, like is trying to figure out uh, who is contacting Bug and what is going on. And um, I've spoken to you and you have said that you're not actually sure whether the, like there is actually a ghost in this story. Um, and I feel very strongly that there is, but um, you have expressed ambivalence about this. Um, and I wanted to ask you about the decisions you made writing um, the ghost interactions in this story and the kind of poltergeist events and, um, and what you were thinking about writing them. Yeah, so for one, so all the, all the ghostly things that happen are just, ghost things that I've picked up from other books. Like I read a lot as a kid, which is I'm sure shocking to everyone. And I love ghost stories. And so I didn't really decide to come up with like an overarching theory about the supernatural. I just pulled little bits and pieces from like every ghost story that I liked. Like there's a cold spot and there's doors slamming and there's a Ouija board. And it's like very kind of classic in that sense, I think. But it's true, I don't, I don't actually know if there was really a ghost or if it was all bugs kind of like imagination slash naturally occurring things like drafts and, you know, just doors closing because it's an old house and cold spots because of drafts. I said drafts already. Um, and part of that is because I'm somewhat agnostic on the concept of ghosts, period. Uh, just like personally, I don't know if they're real. I hope they're not because I'm scared of them, um, but maybe they're not. So that's good for me. Um, but also because I try to write my books to be open questions. I like books that ask more questions than they answer. And I try to do that in all of my books. So like in my picture book, when Aiden became a brother, there's a scene where Aiden said, where it says, um, Aiden could tell that he wanted to ask a different question about a stranger sort of like interrogating him about his new sibling. And I've gotten people say, well, what was the pink guy asking? And I'm like, I don't know, what do you think? Like, what are some questions this person might have? What are some questions that you might have experienced in a similar situation? And I wanted to make the ghostly parts somewhat ambiguous because I wanted to leave readers with this question. Was there a ghost? Was it just the wind the whole time? Was it Bugs' own sort of internal sense of strife and drama? Like, was Bugs sleepwalking? Is that why Bugs' room was all messed up and the nail polish bottle was broken? Um, because of Bugs' like grief and angst and dysphoria. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily think it would be a stronger book if I had all the answers also. Like I think that what's important to me as a writer and an educator and, a, and as a person is asking questions with a lot of possible answers and letting readers sort of fill in their own gaps and their own ideas rather than telling you, oh yeah, that's definitely true. That's definitely what I did, did on purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying, I don't know. Yeah. So like one of my favorite ghost eBooks um, as a kid was like called The Headless Cupid. Um, and I think it's a Zilfa Keatley Snyder mm -hmm. book. Um, and that one has a, a tween witch um, who is kind of manufacturing poltergeist activity in her house. Um, and I, I was very compelled by it as a kid because there is this sense of like, there is a greater kind of spiritual force of, of malignant rage and frustration um, in addition to like what she is physically doing in the house. Um, and in Too Bright to See, um, 
like my the interpretation I I sort of lean towards of like all of the supernatural events is that Uncle Roderick is attempting to communicate and then also Bug is sort of subsumed in grief and frustration and confusion um, that Bug doesn't really know how to express yet and doesn't really have the desire to like express as actual rage towards anyone around Bug um, and doesn't have like the words for it. And so there's there's like multiple levels of spiritual activity and some of it is like um, the spirit of someone who cares about you trying to talk to you and some of it is like your own anger and grief um, and uh, sadness and maybe mingling with like the spiritual forces of like all of the other people who have lived in this house and experienced like grief and pain at different points in their lives. Um, You're and the, probably right. The, the setting is so is so good and I love the way that at one point um, Bug talks about like all of the generations of people who have lived in the house um, and all of their ghosts. Um, and something else in this book that I think is uh, very beautiful and cool is just the way that it talks about like generations of queer people looking out for each other. Um, and whether or not Uncle Roderick's ghost is a real supernatural presence that is speaking to Bug, um, we learned through the story that Uncle Roderick was looking out for Bug and cared about Bug deeply and understood things about Bug that Bug didn't understand about himself yet. Um, which like, I'm feeling my little tears come up right now just <laughs> thinking about it. But um, I specifically, I love the scene where Bug is rifling through Uncle Roderick's things and finds all of the materials uh, about, about um, trans kids, sorry, not to spoil stuff. But, um, and then I also love, there's this scene where Bug is, um, standing in a cold stream and is standing there for a long time and is theoretically like fishing for minnows uh, and then kind of gets frozen and hears the burble of the stream but suddenly the burble of the stream sounds like a voice and it sounds like Uncle Roderick's voice and it's the same tone that Uncle Roderick used when Bug was little and was about to touch like a hot kettle um, and was trying to warn Bug and then it becomes like softer but Bug can't understand the words that Uncle Roderick is saying um, and is just standing in the stream, listening to the stream that is also Uncle Roderick's voice. Um, and that made me cry and makes me cry every time I think about it. Um, and it it feels, it feels really good for me to imagine uh, generations of older queer people who understand or connect to younger queer people and are, are watching out for them and are trying to keep them safe. Um, and I felt really good reading your book because of this, but I was wondering if you wanted to talk about things you were thinking about, about relationships between generations of, of queer people when you were writing this book. Yeah, so I had two, two significant impulses and in including that aside from the fact that like, it's just the plot and there'd be no plot without it. Um, the first is that all in all of my books, I am primarily concerned with intra-community conversation and like intra-community dynamics. I'm not really interested in homophobia from straight people. Like it's not that one shouldn't write about it or that like books shouldn't include it. I personally just don't find it interesting um, because it's always just kind of just, it's just, I don't know. And similarly, I'm not super interested in like transphobia from cis people. I've experienced it, it's real, it is deadly and it is a you know real force that shapes our lives but I'm also not intellectually compelled by it. It's just this bad thing that is around that I don't really feel like tackling in my fiction. Um, but I'm, I am interested in intra-community things. Like what do we talk about when we're by ourselves? Like who do we not like and why? Like what dramas do we have? And like how do like oppressions play out within, within and between us? Like that I find much more interesting. Um, so I always wanna create books where there is like LGBT community, but this book is also very isolated physically. So I wanted there, I didn't want there to just be one queer character. I needed there to be at least a couple. And then I wanted Roderick to be connected to a larger queer community where he had been living before they moved to Vermont. Um, so that, you know, Bug might only have Uncle Roderick to look up to, but through Uncle Roderick, Bug is aware that there are lots and lots and lots and lots of queer people. They just don't happen to be around all the time. But so I think it keeps the novel from feeling isolated and it keeps it from feeling like one, it, it keeps it from feeling like 
uh, being queer is what makes these characters like different or separate. It's just part of who they are and it's what connects them to something larger than themselves. Um, and then similarly to intra-community dynamics, I'm also really, I've always cared a lot about intergenerational queer relationships. Um, I've had, you know, some of the most important people in my life have been trans men who are significantly older than me, like 20, 25 years older than me, who transitioned like when I was a child. And for like, you know, some of them I've had negative relationships with, but even those have been so fundamental and foundational for me learning about who I am and what this world that I'm entering into used to be like and what it could be in the future. Um, so, I mean, Uncle Roderick isn't a trans man, but I still wanted to include this sense of like queer people existed before you and you're not making this up and you're also not inventing it and you can make of it what you will moving forward, but you also come from something real, like you come from a real culture. Um, and then there was one more thing. What was it? I don't remember right now. Oh, I had another thought and it's gone. Maybe it'll come back. Yeah, um, I I also feel um, that like relationships with elders are really important to to feeling like positive and not lost in the world. Um, and I am very glad that this book exists for very young people to think about like who their elders are um, and what what people who came before them and may not be around anymore like did in the world um, as a model for like what they could do or choose not to do. Um, and uh, like, I think that the communication with um, those elders uh, sometimes feels so remote and, and um, I, I like, that there's kind of a element here of we're not totally sure if Bug is actually communicating with Roderick or just imagining Roderick. Um, and there is a kind of pain to that, but also like um, there is space for Bug to imagine um, knowing like the love that Roderick had for him, like imagine kind of the best, the best conversation possible. And um, there's kind of like a, I don't know, there's sort of a, like a reparative thing in engaging with ghosts and imagining like um, like what what conversations you didn't get to have um, that could still like sort of happen uh, for closure and for for growth. Um, and it's it's very beautiful. Um, so what went into your choices about like the different ways that Roderick communicates with Bug? Um, um, and like the different actions uh, that the ghost uses to communicate. That was really hard to come up with because, you know, it's a novel. There needs to be a thing to find out and there needs to be like, you, you can't just answer the question right away because that's a paragraph. Um, so I had to come up with ways that a ghost would try to communicate that could kind of start to get the message across, but wouldn't, but it couldn't just be like, the a translucent corporeal form like tapping bug on the shoulder and be like hey kiddo can we sit down for a second i've got other places to be i have to like pass on beyond the veil but really quick let me just tell you this thing that i never got around to and i'm really sorry i didn't get to it like that would be like one chapter of a short story and then it would be done and i wouldn't have an entire book um but it also couldn't be like vague formless uh occurrences that Bug is used to because then it wouldn't spur Bug on to like figure out what was going on and to sense that there's something different going on than had been going on the whole time. Um, so I just sort of, like I said before, like I took, I took little things that I knew from ghost stories and adapted them to sort of fit that middle ground, but then also had a bit where Bug is doing some research on ghosts and like finds out this like true thing that I maybe made up, I'm not sure, that like ghosts are still like the they still have like remnants of the person that they used to be but they're also somewhat like formless chaotic bundles of energy that can't really communicate the way that they used to um so there's like a consciousness and intention behind it but not the same like embodied grounded intentional ways of communicating that like 
human beings, corporeal, alive people have. So I had to sort of like thread a middle ground of like chaotic, chaotic and chaotic energy with conscious intent behind it. Um, I've been worried that people are going to read it and be like, oh, that's too contrived. Like if this really was a ghost of Uncle Roderick, then he could just like write down a thing and leave it. Um, but I wanted it to be more complicated than that because that's how you make a book. So some of it was just like, because otherwise the story wouldn't work. And I hope that it, I hope that it does work and it's not too easy or too like convenient, you know? Um, I think it rules. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, so the other like ghostly or like unsettling aspect of the book is just like Bugs physical experience as a person in the world. Um, and I know we said you were going to ask me a question about this, but I think I just, I, I just want to like it, the, the dysphoria bug is experiencing also feels like unearthly and unsettling um, in this way that feels very accurate to my experiences as like an adolescent child. Um, and bug is kind of, is, is an expert at um, externalizing um, experiences and just choosing not to be directly like in his own life. Um, and that felt very uh, real, um, especially constantly imagining um, his experiences in the third person and narrating about like the girl that he would be if he was in a book. Um, and it was like about a Victorian child escaping from something or whatever, um, or like he's running through a field and he's like the girl's barefoot ran through the grass or whatever. Um, and, and kind of imagining like, okay, externally, like this is the narrative about my life that like another person would see. Um, and, and I'm going to like place myself in this narrative um, and then like looking in the mirror and not being able to identify uh, his face as his own. Um, and, and that being described as like, as equally kind of supernatural and unsettling as all of the ghost things. Um, but that is just like an aspect of Bug's existence um, that has nothing to do with the ghosts. Um, all, of, all of that felt just very real and just the kind of like vague unsettling um, feeling of like not being in your own body and not owning your own body. Uh, like it, it is, um, it is very accurate and it is I think the most accurate description of like what dysphoria feels like before you know that's what it's called um, in a, especially in a book for kids, but just like in general, um, like it's, there's a lot of sort of contrived narratives out there uh, about like, oh, like I have this specific gender related angst about like my body that this, this author is now gonna describe in detail. Um, I hate the color pink. Yeah, I- That's oh, gross I, and for yeah. girls, not yeah. boys like me. Yeah, or like, just, just like a sense of like, wow, I wish I was a, I wish I was a boy. And I think that Bug's experience of like reading about trans people and then like it taking like several beats after reading about trans people for the first time before Bug is like, well, it would be great if I was trans. Like if, if like trans people like know exactly what they want and that's so cool. Um, like I wish, I wish like I was, you know, like that, like they know, they know exactly what it is. Um, and then like, there's like the beat the beat and then like oh um, we should have put some like major spoiler warnings ahead of this oops uh, sorry everyone but yeah I mean I also am just really bad at spoiling books <laughs> because it's not about the plot like it's yeah it, it's about the experience of reading it um so I was so that whole part was really okay so first I wrote the thing and I was like I don't know if this is ever gonna get published is anyone even gonna like this and then it got published and then like I, it got sold and then I have this anxious feeling of like oh my god other people are gonna read this is this like really gonna make sense to anyone because this this and like when you started telling me about the book like after you read it I had this really intense emotional experience of realizing that this thing that I thought was just a very like specific isolating experience that I dredged up from the depths of my childhood is in fact deeply relatable to so many people. And I did not know that. Um, so like when I was reading that, when I was writing it, 
I decided to have Bug externally narrate what was going on. Like, you know, the girl ran through the field and she felt the wind in her face. Because I did that, because it made me feel more real, but no one, I didn't know if anyone else did that. And I assumed that other people were just alive and just doing things and other people were more real the way that, like people, other people were real human beings. And I had to constantly remind myself of that fact and try to convince myself it was true. So then when my agent read it for the first time, she was like, I love that part. And I was like, really? That's not too weird. Like, that's not too like foreign and unrelatable and bizarre. And she's like, no, it's perfect. And I was like, okay, if you say so, I don't know if that's true though. Um, and since sending out galleys of it and, and like, you know, and then since it came out, I've had people say like, that was me. Like I felt the same kind of profound dissociation and detachment from reality and constantly had to remind myself that I was also a real human being. And I kind of wish that I could go back to me in third grade and be like, hey buddy, like other people are as fucked up as you are. Like, oh, sorry, if there's children, I didn't mean to say the F word, I'm very sorry. I don't know who all's in the audience. If there's kids, I'm very sorry. Um, like, I wish I could have gone back to my third grade self and been like, hey kid, like other people feel really bad too. And like no one, or lots of people don't feel like they're real human beings. And this doesn't make you as different as you think it does. But I don't know if that would have helped. I don't think I would have believed me because I still don't really, I don't know. So actually, and like the thing that I'd wanted to ask you that you had answered is that, so also like Bug is 11 going on 12 in this. Um, I am 36 and I came out as trans in college. I was like 21 or so. And I didn't know if this would resonate with people who actually did come out in childhood or early adolescence. Like if you came out when you were like 11, 12, 13, was this what it was like for you? And I had one person, he's 19 now, but he came out when he was 13. He was like, yeah, no, that was exactly me. That was exactly what I was like. Um, and you said that it, and you've said that it's also really resonant for you. And that was a huge risk. Like I felt really scared about that because I didn't know if it was just like dredging up memories of my childhood that no one else could relate to, or if it was something that was in fact more relatable, especially for like trans masculine people like myself. Yeah, it feels, it feels very real. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, and like I came out when I was 13 and for the two years prior to that, I was just sort of like, you know, trying, trying different bits uh, and trying to like make a personality out of sort of like different strange affects. Um, and part of that is like also a thing that just like children do and like gay children do um, like, uh, like construct odd personalities to inhabit. Um, Me never. Yeah, but like, uh, like I had, I had like a while where I was like, I'm gonna wear like long dresses with shawls, and that's a thing. Like that can just that can just be like my personality. Um, like I can be sort of like a witch, um, <laughs> uh, and it didn't it didn't really work um it was it was fun to imagine like oh I'm like a character in like a Diana Wynne Jones novel or something but uh it didn't actually work to like live in the world um and uh I think I think if like it had been a different cultural moment it would have also taken me a lot longer and like many more bits um to to figure out what was going on um Kyle, do you want to read from your book and then we can yeah. do Q&A if people have questions? Sure, I'll read from the prologue because I love the prologue. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have like plenty of time for either, like I'm fine with questions. I mean, I love questions, but this is also the sort of thing where like, this is more of a comment I also feel okay about. Um, I know that's a risk, but like, let's see what happens. Um, so, oh, also, can I explain the can I explain the first sentence really quickly? I really want to. Um, so, when I was a kid, I don't remember how old I was, but my dad told me that he had written uh, a short story. He's my dad isn't really a writer that I know of, but he like dabbled in fiction when he was younger, and he said that he wrote a short story. He wrote a murder mystery. He didn't remember anything about it except for the first sentence, and he said that he was very proud of the first sentence. Um, and the first sentence was, "It was strange living in the old house now that Uncle Roderick was dead." And as a kid, I was like, wow, that's so good. My dad is so smart. My dad is the smartest. Um, and that sentence just always kind of stuck with me in the back of my head. And when it, when I decided I want to try a middle grade novel, I was like, I'm going to use that. I'm just going to steal my dad's first sentence and see what happens. So 
Yeah. I don't know if he's read it yet. I want to know what he thinks. My dad doesn't really like fantasy, though, so I don't know if he'll like this. Oh, well. All right, prologue. It's strange living in our old house now that Uncle Roderick is dead. I already know my house is haunted. It's always been haunted. That hasn't changed. We avoid the freezing cold spot in the corner of the living room because someone probably died there. Windows slam themselves open or shut on the stillest days. So do doors, and these doors are heavy. For a long time, I thought it was normal to sense someone standing behind you or next to you and not be able to see them, for invisible hands to brush past your hair, your clothes. And it looks haunted, wooden, unpainted, weathered with time. There's an elaborately carved front door, peaked roofs jutting out in all directions, tall windows with shapes flickering behind them. The porch wraps around front to back with rocking chairs that sometimes rock on their own. We're out in the middle of nowhere, and at nighttime there's moonlight and starlight and nothing else. When I was in kindergarten, when I was in kindergarten, I checked a book out of the library because the house on the front cover looked like a photograph of my home. Uncle Roderick tried reading it to me that night, my head resting on his chest, his arm tucked beneath my shoulders. We always read together before bed. He had to stop after the first chapter because it was a collection of scary stories. He believed the dreams were important and he didn't want to give me bad ones. But now this old house seems haunted in a different way, a way that's both more boring and more frightening. There's a half empty jar of okra Uncle Roderick picked and pickled that he'll never finish eating. And mom and I both hate okra. His winter boots are jammed in the closet. He always put off wearing them for as long as possible, saying they made him look like a lumberjack, but now he'll never need them again. He subscribed to magazines, The New Yorker, National Geographic, and they'll keep being addressed to him until we tell them to stop, until they take his name off the list forever. I prefer the ghosts. That's the prologue. Um, are there like questions and or relevant comments from people in the audience? That would be cool. And if you want, you can put them in the chat function or you can just speak out. Okay, I have a question. Hi, Julian. Hello. Um, so earlier when you were talking about, you know, the importance of multiple generation relationships, I suspected that the second half that you lost was talking about younger people than you. And even if I'm totally wrong, I'm going to, I'm going to make you talk about that now. <laughs> so totally. You said that you talked to a few specific individuals about, you know, being out when they were younger than you'd ever been out. But um, obviously you have professional experience working with children and you've met a lot of trans children who are very young. And in so far as it's like, you know, reasonable to share, I'd love to hear more about how those relationships have shaped um, your work and your character development in particular. You are right. That is exactly what I was going to say and that I forgot. So thank you for, thank you for putting those pieces together. Um, so yeah, so okay. Um, I worked in an elementary school for eight years with kids two-year-olds through fifth grade. And I've had experiences of some kids that I didn't necessarily clock or peg coming out as queer or trans after graduating. Um, but then there were also, the thing that was hard for me is that I have I met a lot of kids who were either like obviously queer or that I kind of had my eye on as being something. And there is no way that I felt good going up to a child, especially a child that was like not mine, that was like my student and not like my nephew or whatever. And be like, hey kiddo, you know what you are. Let me tell you something about yourself. Because that felt like, not only would that be like wildly inappropriate to tell like a second grader, like, hey buddy, you're, you're definitely gay. Like that's, that, make, that makes me feel very uncomfortable. But also there's this idea that like, that I, I believe, which is that I don't think that you should tell someone about themselves, especially if they are not already there. So like, I remember I was, you know, much older. I was like 18 or 19 and I, had this kind of guess of like maybe I wasn't a cis girl but I wasn't really sure and then I had other people like oh like you should start hormones you should get top surgery and I was like I don't 
I don't know if I should. Why are you telling me that I should if I don't know if I should? Like, don't tell me, don't tell me who I am and don't tell me what I should do. Um, it just didn't feel good to me. And I also believe similarly that you have to get to a place where you are ready to know that about yourself and people telling you before you're ready will not do any good and may in fact uh, make it harder for you to get there by yourself, especially depending on your relationship. Like you might have the relationship with this person where you're like, no, like, no, nah, man, I'm not like you, I'm different. And then even if you realize that you're not, you might be too stubborn to be like, oh, you were right. Um, and then there's also the idea that like, I might have my eye on someone and have like a guess, but like, I'm not like a, I don't have like the finest tuned gaydar. Like I could sense that something's going on, but I don't know what that'll look like for you. Like maybe what I'm reading as like gay might actually be like non-binary and ace, or like maybe what I read is like definitely transmasculine is like more like butch, like butch girl who is also straight. Like I, can like have a sense that something is up, but I also don't feel like it's my job to be like, this is who you are for sure. So that's also why I wanted there to be this sense of like Uncle Roderick knows that something is going on and has a suspicion, but also at no point was like, hey buddy, here's a thing about you that I know is true, um, which is why he died without having that conversation in person because he was waiting for Bug to sort of get there independently because I believe that that is the ethical thing to do when trying to mentor or be there for you that you think might be queer in one way or another. Um, but I also do feel very gratified when I find out that I was right. Like there's a kid in my second novel that we don't have a title yet, but it's coming out next year where, so I based a character on this kid and the character was like somewhat undeveloped because the kid in my mind, I was like, you've got something up. I don't know what it is. You're kind of a weirdo but I can just like sense something about you. And then I left the school, the kid graduated and the kid in the novel started to become much more like a fully developed, extremely interesting character. And then I found out that the real kid had come out as trans. And I was like, I, I knew it. Like I knew that there was something and I didn't know what, but I was right. And I like have proof that I knew it beforehand. I was so proud of myself. Um, yeah, so. That answers your question. I know it's kind of like a rambling answer, but yeah. It it does answer my question. Thank you. You're welcome. There's a question in the chat. Uh, curious if you had young people read earlier drafts, and if so, did you end up incorporating any of their feedback? And how many drafts of this book did I have? So I did not have any. I didn't have anyone read drafts of this before. Who did I send it to? I sent it to like a friend who is my age. I sent it and then I sent it to my agent. Um, I didn't have any kids read it partially because that's a lot of work for a child. Like I don't necessarily need to make a 10 year old do unpaid labor for me. And I also really <laughs> want to pay a 10 year old. To um, and also, you know, I, okay. I love, I love kids. I have tremendous respect for kids as full human beings. And I always learn a lot from my students about like what works in books, what they like, what they don't like. But I don't necessarily see children as being editors for me. Um, and I don't necessarily see children as being like uh, critics in a way that would be helpful, um, especially because even getting adults to read it, like one person will love it and one person will hate it. And one person will really like this part and one person will really hate that part. That was something that was a that was a corner that I got myself into with the first novel I tried to write where I got so many people to read it and so many people gave me so much feedback and I couldn't incorporate all of it because they were all telling me different things. So I decided just to write a book that felt right and hope that other people agreed. Um, but but what I do do now is I, I have a couple of my former students that I'm friendly with. I also clear this with their parents out of time. Like I'm not like contacting children without whatever, but a couple of my former students I'm in touch with, and I will actually regularly like text them and be like, hey, do kids your age use this word regularly? Or like, if I said this in a book, would a kid your age know what that meant? Um, and that's been hugely helpful, having like real live 13 year olds who know about like queer stuff to be like, oh no, we don't use that word anymore. Like that's for old people. Oh, and then how many drafts of this one? Um, well, to get to a finished draft took 
like three years. I started it and then I gave up and then I tried again and then I kept giving up. Um, but then in terms of major drafts, I think it was like one final, final draft that I sent to my agent and then she had some edits to make. Um, and then my editor, I think I got like two or three major edit letters, but the final version is just like a strength and an improved version of the first draft. So it's not, uh, I don't think it went through like profound changes. I think it just got better, if that makes sense. Uh, like adding salt to a dish instead of throwing it away and starting new. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments for either Kyle or Hal? I did put the links for both um, Kyle's Too Bright to See and for Hal's Out of Salem in the chat. While you're thinking, I can tell you my favorite story of all time from a kid who's probably gay. Um, he was Please. a first grader, but he's he's like obsessed with Ursula and the Little Mermaid and like Scar and like all the queer coded villains. And like there's a video of him like singing a song from Les Mis and I hate this. Um, anyway, but one time he was in the cafeteria and he was telling me what he wanted to be when he grew up. And he was like, he was like going like this with his hands like I might want to be a librarian or a Broadway actor or a journalist. And his like legs were crossed, which none of this is proof of anything. Of course, I know this. But then another a girl was saying, well, I want to be a rock and roll star, but I also want to have a baby. And he said, well, you have to get married if you want to have a baby. And she said, no, I don't have to marry a boy to have a baby. Some girls don't marry boys because because some girls don't even like boys. And his head whipped around and he said, who doesn't like boys? <laughs> so I can't, you know, I didn't say to him, hey pal, I know something about you that you might not be so sure about yet, but like, you know, I have my suspicions about this child and I might be wrong, I don't know, but I, I yeah, it's delightful. Um, can I tell a story also about like anticipating a child like yes. moment and then being right? I'm not gonna disclose um, any, I, I don't know, like identifying details about this child, but there was um, a child at uh, the school uh, that someone I know works at. And uh, this kid is 13 in eighth grade, shaggy hair, big glasses, obsessed with pigeons and then obsessed with um, creating structures out of Furbies, which is apparently like a fad for tweens and teens online is taking old Furbies and making them into new forms. So this child had a, a long Furby that was worn like a scarf over their shoulders. Um, and the Furby had like earrings on its little ears. Um, and this child, did a like presentation on snake oil medicine and like medical scans uh, as like a research project. Um, and the person I knew who worked at the school and me both were like, this child is like transmasculine because of like the sheer level of just kind of like interesting weirdness present here. <laughs> and we know this for sure. And then the the person I know overheard um, this, this kid's friends using he, him pronouns uh, like, months and months and months before the kid changed his name, but he did eventually change his name and come out as trans. And they were like, we knew it, you got a long Furby, like there's like, there's stuff happening here. Yeah. Um, and it was just like, and also was like a moment of like, um, the person they knew being like, okay, there's like queer teachers at this school, this kid is gonna be fine. But like, I'm like waiting on tender hooks for like this child to like realize this thing. Um, <laughs> Um, there's a question from Aida Salazar, who's amazing. You should read her book, The Moon Within, and also her book, The Land of the Cranes, which is one of the most intense middle grade novels I've ever read. It's so good. Everyone look her up. Um, she said, can you talk a little about your relationship to writing for children? Do you write for them or do you write for you or for some other purpose? Um, the first reason that I write just as an act is because I'm often lonely. Um, I started writing because like I have a lot of friends like I have a wide and rich community but also like I don't know I'm very extroverted and I can't cut out my friends to hang out with me every single time I need them to so I started writing because I was lonely and I wanted something to do which is why I think I've been so productive during COVID is because I'm like yes when I'm lonely this is what I do and I've been very lonely this year um, 
So I primarily write to make myself feel better. But then I decided, but then after that, I do specifically and intentionally write for kids because I know them. You know, like I worked with kids for so long and my entire job was talking to them about books and helping them find books and listening to them talk about books and like seeing what books they brought back with the bookmark like a third of the way through because I got bored and gave up or like what books do are, are they literally fighting over and what books do they check out like time and time and time again. Um, so I, I tend to, I am not the kind of person who like has a story burning within me that I need to put out into the world. I, I have an intention to create an object and that object is a specific book for a specific age group because I want this object to exist and I want to be the one to do it. Um, it, you know, the writing process can feel magical and uh, ineffable and, you know, yeah, literally just magical. But my primary impulse is to make myself feel better and to create a specific object. Um, I don't really see, I don't really identify as like a storyteller or someone with like, you know, tales burning within me that need to see the light of day. It's like, I want this object to exist. And I have this hobby that keeps me from feeling bad about myself. So I'll just put those two together. So yeah, I think the answer to your question is yes to all of them. We've got a little more time, but I'm also happy to wrap up. Yeah. Oh, how did Hal and I meet? Oh, dear. Um, Hal, I'm happy to be honest, especially because I'm not in the best light, but you can also tell if you want to. I don't know. Or we can tell our two different versions. Sure. Um, my version is that I was trying to publish out of Salem my first novel with a small trans press. Um, now defunct. And that press does not exist anymore. And um, my, my friend Stephen was like, I think you should be careful with this small trans press. And I think Kyle Lukoff can tell you about why. <laughs> um, and then I went over to Kyle's house and Kyle uh, told me um, just about some experience that, experiences that other authors had had um, and lent me a bunch of books. Um, and I already knew that I also wanted to be a librarian. And so then I just kind of like uh, uh, bothered Kyle periodically about either author stuff or librarian stuff because Kyle had been a librarian for a longer time and uh, had been writing books for a longer time. Um, and, uh, I specifically, this might, I might have fabricated this, but I feel like I remember you coming to my apartment for the first time and looking around and saying, I think I want to be you when I grow up and me being like, okay. I mean, it was, it was like a very, I, I had just moved to New York city and I was, um, a baby and I did not have a clear picture of what the future was going to hold exactly. I had considered library school. Um, so meeting someone who is like a school librarian and working with kids and like reviewing books for kids and stuff. It was like, oh, I could, this could happen. Like I could, I could make this happen. Um, and also like I could stop working five different retail jobs um, and bicycling all over the city in the rain to get from one job to the next. Um, you know, queer, queer mentorship. Um, and I really appreciate the uh, advice that you had the first time I met you um, and it was correct. Uh, and though though the the small trans press did produce um, several several very good books, um, it did so with a with a chaotic fashion. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I it was correct advice. That's basically it. <laughs> so sweet. Anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns? <laughs> concerns. I mean, that's <laughs> fine, I guess. <laughs> You're allowed. You're allowed to be concerned. <laughs> that's such a sweet story about how you guys met and the mentorship. I love that. I love hearing about queer mentorship.
I had a little bit of challenge because I immediately perceived Hal as like doing better than me in most arenas. Um, so I was actually struggling with like a fair amount of jealousy in that regard. Um, I never was like, Hal's bad and is doing bad thing. I was just like, I feel <laughs> weird. I don't know. Um, and then we eventually had like an honest conversation where I was like, I'm feeling like weird and bad for some reasons. And Hal was like, I'm so sorry. I can see how that could happen. And then I was like, cool, well, let's, I forgive you. And now we're like legitimately friends and I like value Hal immensely as both like a librarian and a writer and someone that I share community with. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's um, very much a thing that I have done to other people. And like now I am reaching a point where younger people sometimes do it to me where like there are relatively few queer or trans people doing the thing that you want to be doing. And so latching onto someone who is already yeah. doing it is easy. Um, and uh, like, I, I did use you as like a reference point for like, where should I, where should I be in my life? Uh, what should I be working on? Um, and it can, it can feel bad to be the focus of someone else's attention in that way. Um, I, also think, Kyle, that you just are very self-deprecating uh, because Me? you were you were extremely <laughs> you were, like you had several books written, even if they weren't purchased for publication yet. Like you you have been working at your career for a long time and are like very accomplished at what you do, and also like very different from me um and the, like the kind of books you write and the kind of um like work with children that you have done and like you've planned many years of curriculums and stuff. Um, yeah. I'm not saying I was right. I'm just saying what I was feeling, yeah. <laughs> which is different from things that are true and correct. In the world. Yeah. Um, and then Aida also asked about censorship. Um, well, my book, Call Me Max, was the center of controversy in two different school districts in Salt Lake City and outside of Austin, um, which was my first real experience with like tremendous community backlash to teachers reading my books to kids. Um, and we'll see what, I mean, I assume that it will continue to happen at, you know, I mean, Aida, your books have also experienced challenges as well. Um, I'm not going to say, I'm not worried about it because I know it's going to happen. Like I knew that it was going to happen from the day that I sold when Aiden became a brother. And I've been as prepared for it as I think a person can be, which is to say like, I have talking points, I have defenses, I have some like emotional resources undergirding that. Um, you know, I'm afraid of violence. I'm afraid of like exposing myself or my roommate to violence or doxing. Um, I'm worried about the people in communities who have to defend their right to exist when my books become the center of controversy. But I'm not worried because I knew it was gonna happen. And I think you only worry if you're unsure of something and I'm very sure, so. Yay. And Aida, I also want to say, like, I love your books um, and uh, the kids who come to New York Public Library also, like, consistently gravitate towards them uh, I, when they are on display. Like, um, kids go pick them up and look at them and then are, like, and, and take them. Like, they disappear from displays when we put them on display. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, yes. I don't know where you are, but it's kind of like over overcast and gross here in New York. So it's lovely to sit here and like chat with people. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Kyle. And thank you so much, Hal. So good to have you back at the Bureau, even if it is virtually. We know we'll be back together someday. Um, and I really appreciate it, even though I know we're all kind of tired of the zooming, but it's what we got. <laughs> so I'm glad we have it so much better than nothing. Um, and I've linked to both uh, Kyle's book and Hal's book. And Kyle has several other books on our site as well, if you go to the children books section. Um, so thank you, everyone. I'm going to post this on YouTube. I'll send the link to you, Kyle and Hal. And uh, I hope everyone has a lovely, lovely day. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye.